And uh, my favor to all of the saints and friends, I preach in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to see everybody here in the house on this morning. And I do thank and uh, honor this opportunity to stand before you with the first word. So if you'd be so kind, if you would uh, turn to the Gospel of John. The first chapter of John. with the first verse, and it is our custom if you would please stand for the reading of the word. <laughs> if you have to say amen. Amen. If you need to wait, say wait. <laughs> Slow them like Chinese. Come on, Lennox. <laughs> amen, amen. So this is recorded in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Second reading, verse 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. May the Lord add a blessing to the doers and hearers of the Word. You may be seated. Father oh God, in the name of Jesus, I humble myself before you, asking that you come in today, Lord, take charge of this period of time as we look into your Word, Father God. Bless us with a impartation of understanding that we leave here better than we can. So I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I'd like to just leave this thought with you as we discuss God is. God is. And then when you hear that, you're thinking, okay, is there something missing? Is that a complete sentence? Some of us would uh, lean on our punctuation and say, uh, do I need to have an exclamation point there? How forceful are you trying to be? Is this a, a question mark situation? Is, is there an ellipsis there? What is that? God is. Others of the household of faith would tell you uh, from their experience that God is a, a doctor in a sick room. He is a lawyer in a courtroom. Uh, he's been described as a way maker, a mind regulator, and a heart fixer. But in, our, in reality, our God is all of that and so much more. However, to be an unbeliever, Where are you going? this topic speaks to the root of unbelief. Like Thomas, many find it hard to believe in, in an intangible God whose physical presence must be quantified or measured to gain attention. Unlike Thomas, we will not have the opportunity to see the nail marks or touch our Lord's pierced side. If there's anyone under the sound of my voice that finds it hard to let go of their need to satisfy their natural senses, I can offer one tangible piece of evidence. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please allow me to ask for your assistance for the next few minutes. If you have a smartphone, please stand up. Doesn't matter whether it's Android or if you're an apostolic. If you have a smartphone, please stand up. All right, now, if you can remember 10 numbers, you can remember 10 telephone numbers inside your phone, please sit down. So everybody sat down. Can remember 10 telephone numbers that are in their phone? Well, praise the Lord. For those of you at least who are still standing, you serve as the example of why they call it a smartphone. Right? <laughs> because it is taking all of the knowledge out of your head to allow to make room for things of less importance. Please, everybody can please be seated. If you don't have the Emmanuel Temple app in your smartphone, I would encourage you, before you leave the sanctuary today, please go to your store, download the ET app for your phone. You will be kept up on the latest news 
and happy things. You'll have an opportunity to see our church calendar. It knows going on here at Emmanuel Temple. But most importantly, on that app, you will find a link to God's Word, the Bible. It's important to have that Bible on hand every moment of the day because you never know when you're going to need it. There's, I imagine there's only a few people in the world with maybe a photographic memory that can commit the whole Bible to memory and be able to regurgitate it at will or at need. But if you have the scriptures handy, whether in paper format, and now everybody goes electronic, but do have that. Get that. The main reason I say that is because if it's in your phone, again, you'll have access. Not too many of us with a cell phone are going to leave home, go to work or school without that phone. Can I get an amen? amen? And if you do leave home, I can be a fortune teller and see a U-turn in your immediate future. <laughs> so you should always be armed with your sword. To me, that scripture... Uh, okay, having the Bible at your fingertips um, is where I build my argument for the tangible nature of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. To me, the scripture sounds pretty cut and dry. But many still have doubt. I find it quite interesting that prior to this leap in technology, people would write down letters to communicate feelings, desires, emotions, and instructions. Those letters would sometimes be addressed to men or women the writer had never even met. Back in the day, uh, we called those pen pals. There are also thousands of ministries who write letters of encouragement to inmates in state and federal facilities. A lot of times they don't even know the inmates, but they're still able to communicate by the word. Global missions touches the lives of families who are less fortunate living in third world environments, and in return, they'll receive a thank you letter from somebody that they blessed but they have not ever met. That all sounds fairly uh, routine and tangible. So why the double standard concerning the Word of God? You know, it's interesting about our phones. The government has access to access your phone wherever you're at. They can look to see where you're at through your phone. If you can set that phone down, they can turn that camera on and see what's going on in your world. But you know what? We serve a God that's omnipresent. He doesn't need technology to see what we're doing. He sees us every minute of the day. But we, once again, will put faith in that tangible item that I can put in my hand. But still, doubt. So again, having that word at hand is very important. Those 66 books that make up the Old and New Testament have been reprinted billions of times and is a unique experience to each individual reader, just as God intended it to be. Two people can read the same scripture and get two different thoughts or meanings or instructions because the scriptures speak to the needs of the reader individually through the Holy Ghost. So let's review. You have a life situation and turn to the Bible for guidance, instruction, or comfort. You read and meditate on the Word. Relief in the form of understanding comes to you by the Holy Spirit. Sounds like communication and process to me. So what does the Bible say about God? Psalms 46 and 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. John 4 and 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 1 John 4 and 8. He that loveth not knoweth, he that loveth not knoweth, not God. So he that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. And the last scripture I'm going to leave with you today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. And it's recorded. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called 
the Word of God. My brothers and sisters, if any of you have doubts about your faith, have possibly backslidden, or at a crossroad in your life, when the altar call is given, ask God for the strength to move. Don't sit there. Take it from this nobody. Try to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Because based on that last scripture, the one thing I trust and believe, God is. And he is coming soon. Amen.
Amen. If I'm missing anybody else, any of the first time visitors, amen. Sister Brianna Wisher, I don't want to miss him. I don't have a car. Wisher. Will. Will. God bless you, sir. Thank you. myself and the entire Emmanuel Temple family, we're excited that you chose us as your place of worship. Oh, and I don't want to be remiss. We have back in the house with us this morning, Sister Paulita. We're going to ask stand to your feet. It's our custom to love on our visitors and just love on each other. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.
but it's the saints that we're required this morning. Amen. We've enjoyed them. Have you not enjoyed the singing, the worship? Yeah. Amen. We understand that when we come together to worship, it's not for entertainment purposes. They're not here to entertain you. They're, they're here to help agitate an atmosphere and to enter and to usher you into the presence. Hallelujah. for the ministers that are in, in the house this morning and for all of our special guests that are here today, we say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it's certainly it's always an honor and it's good to see uh, Pastor Paul Ward yeah. and Lady Ward. Yeah. Amen. We thank God for them. And that there's good DNA running through this place. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And we give God praise for them. And, I was listening to the songs being sung, and so many songs were about victory and overcoming and strength and recovery. And certainly, that's the God that we serve. The writer says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. He declares, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord. You might be here this morning and you don't feel like you're jumping over walls and running through truth, but you said, I'm in a waiting posture. Understand that that we have been equipped, amen, for the Bible declares that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are effective. They are mighty through God. And I'm telling somebody right now as a soldier, good soldiers, yes, God, a good soldier, you realize that they get a good cadence going. They march and they on the way to warfare. They on their way to warfare or from warfare, but they got a good cadence going. It's a declaration that they are making either towards their enemy or about their ability. And I just came to tell somebody this morning, we got a declaration, we got the victory, we got the victory, we got, we got the victory. I ain't looking, I keep telling y'all, I ain't, I'm not praising for victory, we praise him from victory, he already got the victory. Hallelujah! They that know their God, the writer said, they that know their God shall be strong.
our state, and for the most part, our nation has gotten on board with the reality that one of the greatest dangers to our mortality or our existence, humanly speaking, is the threat of distracted mm -hmm. drivers. And for that reason, recently there was legislation that was passed. And if some of us are not careful, we're going to get a ticket. Uh, because we have become accustomed to being distracted while driving. Yes, sir. And so the legislation states that we are not to have our cellular devices in our hands in operation, diverting our attention because somebody can get hurt Amen. when you distract it. I, I began to consider the word distraction and along with the word distraction came to my mind the word diversion. And, and, and I've heard it said many times that Satan is a master distractor. And, and I would agree with that, but I would raise that statement to another level and declare to us that Satan is not only a master distractor, but more importantly, Satan is a master at diversion. When you consider the word distraction, it simply means that there is something, an object, an individual, there's something that is taking your attention away from one thing and placing it on another thing. Yes, sir. But can I tell you this morning that Satan doesn't have to give us distraction? I'm, I'm going to say that again. I said Satan doesn't have to give us distractions because there are so many things that our hearts are tied to that we allow them to become a distraction. Now, Satan is not just a master distractor, but he's a master at diversion because when you look at the word diversion, it means it is a military tactic that is designed to take your attention away from warfare or proper activity. In other words, Satan wants to put stuff not only to get your attention, but the Bible declares that Satan cometh not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. In other words, Satan is not going to simply put something in front of you spiritually just to get your attention off of one thing to another. Satan has a strategic tactic in which when he puts something in front of you, he is desiring, amen, to take you into warfare and to harm you or to destroy you. Why am I talking like this this morning? I'm not going to be here all day, but I'm talking like this this morning because I'm concerned that when we consider distractions, if we're not careful, we will assume that they are natural occurrences but th there can't be anything harmful in being distracted in other words when God tells us when we feel the presence of the Lord the spirit of the Lord moving on us and says you need to pray you need to spend more time in prayer if the truth be told because we're so busy and we're so tired from our occupations and other things that we have been doing we're so busy we're tired that when we get down to pray if we're not careful is designed to be a diversion, especially when we're talking about the will of God and our, the state, the eternal state of our soul. Every distraction is designed to be a diversion. Do I need to remind us this morning that, amen, our flesh, our flesh lusts against the spirit, that, that my, my, my flesh is at war, is an enmity between the carnal nature or the fleshly nature and the spiritual nature. Yeah. And because of that, when my flesh says I'm tired and I don't feel like doing the will of God, it's not merely a distraction, but it's designed to bring about harm to my spirit. Amen. That's why I can't, I can't just come in, can't just accept the reality that I'm too tired to read the word of God because I understand this morning, Elder Smith, that the word of God it is the sword. 
themselves the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, amen, amen, the shield of faith, our loins being girded about with truth, our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, but brothers and sisters, we must understand that the only offensive weaponry that we have against Satan's arsenal is the is designed to be a diversion. And I'm, I'm not going to have a whole lot of time to unpack all of this, but want us to understand, amen, that in the most chaotic of situations, many times these, uh, these situations begin to yield, amen, to us the greatest opportunities for us to see God. If the truth be told this morning, amen, the greatest times, the times in which I saw God, the clearest and the greatest in my life were times in which I was experiencing the greatest amount of chaos and confusion in my life. Okay. Want us to understand here this morning, I don't want you to be discouraged, amen, by what you are seeing because we don't look at the things that I've seen for the things that I've seen are temporary, but the things that I've not seen yeah. are eternal. Yeah. In other words, amen, what you see with your eyes is not what's going on in the spiritual world. Huh? You need Yeah. 
sisters, you got to be consecrated for. There are some things, yes, God, I hear you now. There are some things that you can't just put your name on the roll as if you want to do it. You need God, my God, to anoint and to sanction you. Lest we cause the holy things of God to be profane. Yes, Lord, thank you now, King Uzziah. I ain't got time to unpack all of this, King. Somebody's got to see God. Somebody's got to stop. 
stop looking at the situation, how good it is or how bad it is. And somebody's got to look to the heel from whence coming our help, knowing all of our help comes from the law. And so the Bible, the Bible declares that he said in the year that you desired to die, see God. The first thing is you got to have some vision. You can't be blind to the situation assuming because you have materialism my God and money that everything is alright. But I can hear the Lord now as he talked to the church of Laodicea. He said you said that you are rich and in need of nothing. But I say that you are naked and destitute. He said you full of yourself. You believe in your own press. Yeah, church lay up to see every pew is filled with people. And you are a dead free church. But I got a problem with you. The passion that you used to have you don't have no more. You start looking to your own sufficiency. My God the spirit of pride and pride will bring about your destruction y'all don't want me to talk the truth here this morning thank you Lord but I know I'm on the right street so if we want to see God we got to first have vision one of the first things we need to ask God to do is Lord touch my eyes help me not to see naturally what's around Trying to tell us when he's looking into heaven, y'all. He 
says, I hear him saying, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. In other words, Isaiah said, when I looked into heaven, I saw that there was no chaos in heaven. Because God is still in control. There might be hell on earth. But when you get a glimpse of God, you'll understand that even in the midst of chaos,
not looking at how many enemies you got. If God be for you, be more than the world against you. Stop looking at how long you've been in that situation. He'll give you back the years that the locust and the caterpillar and the cable worm and palmer worm have eaten up. God can do anything. So we got to look to God. And then we need to look within ourselves. Because when I look in myself, it makes me be humble. It causes me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It causes me. It causes me to be broken. And we need to be broken. We don't need to be believing our own press. We don't need to be standing in our righteousness. We need to be broken. God can't use us until we've been broken. Breaking our pride. Breaking our wheel. Breaking my agenda. Breaking my will. Sitting around. 